at the height of my Christmas um, fanatical state, I don't know, there would be nine or ten Christmas trees at my house. I mean, full size. Not, little ones don't count. Those are just accent pieces. So, <clears throat> but here was the bad part about that, is that I was anal about it. And so, if the Christmas tree was decorated incorrectly, I would take it apart and redo it. Uh, like, like, those ornaments aren't balanced, or that garland, no, 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 I can't be that way. Uh, so, <clears throat> it kind of sucks some life out of my kids, when your kid's like, are you ready, excited for Christmas? They're like, no. She says, why not? You want to decorate? No. Why not? Because dad's going to do it anyway, so just let him do it the first time. <laughs> okay. So my love and zeal for a season got out of control, right? But we all have traditions in our, our family, in our upbringing, and those traditions give us peace at the season. When we go home to a certain family member's house and the certain meal is being made or the certain desserts or, the, or you, you look for your decoration on the tree, like, we can have Christmas now, right? And that's, we know that's not what it's all about, but somehow that context creates peace in our hearts. Well, right beside me, I have a nativity scene, and my mom and I were talking about this. I can't remember our Christmas without this. This is from my childhood, and it started outside. They have little plugs in the back, and every year we decorate the outside of our house for Christmas, and eventually we moved them inside. So I've, I've had these all of my life. Um, my kids played with them, their nieces and nephews and cousins played with them, grandkids are now playing with them, and great-grandkids and so on and so forth. But this was the centerpiece of our Christmas decorating season. So we always started with the nativity. And then I shared with youth group uh, last week that also in the boys' bedroom, there were four of us in one bedroom, it was like a, a dormitory, I've been in the dormitory all my life, <clears throat> there was a Snoopy um, fold-out thing. And my mom took a black marker and said, Santa doesn't stop if your room isn't clean for the entire season. <laughs> and like, we believed her. Like, my mom's a very strong Italian woman, and when she speaks, she doesn't mince words. And so the funny thing is, we look forward to the nativity. We look forward to the uh, Snoopy going up, because it was like, did you put Snoopy up yet? Because if you didn't put it up, we don't have to clean our room. You know, so it works both ways, right? So these traditions give us a sense of peace and security. Well, when we had children, we, we've never, this is the first time in our life that we've lived near family. We've always lived at least eight hours away from our closest relative. <laughs> and so that made it trickier at Christmas. So we drive to South Florida and to South Carolina and back to Pensacola. Then for when we moved to Minnesota, Minnesota to Florida to North Carolina, back to Minnesota. So it's harder to find traditions, right? So one of the things we were, Kimberly read in a magazine once that Starbucks is supposed to be open on Christmas Day. And so you can go in your pajamas and get hot chocolate and coffee. Well, they're not all open. And one, one year, we, we, I forget where we were, we jumped in the car with four children and we couldn't find an open Starbucks. So we got really gross hot chocolate at a, at a really terrifying gas station. But we kept the tradition, right? It was, it was important. And one of the big traditions that, that, we, that we engaged in was Christmas Eve services, no matter where we went. And so if we were going to Kimberly's mom and dad's house, their town would always have a luminary all over town as we came in on Christmas Eve. We'd go to the Christmas Eve service. If we came down here, my mom was at uh, a First Baptist. We'd go there, and then my brother was at a church in Sarasota, and so often we'd go down there. But we planned our, our traveling to be in place for Christmas Eve services. Well, the Christmas Eve service at, at Kimberly's mom and dad's church was a, was a family-oriented service, right? And so we'd come in, there'd be a, a short message, a short um, challenge, and then there would be family communion. So what did that mean? So the pastor would come down first, then the associate pastor, which was a music pastor, which was her dad. And so we would come second. And then all the families in the church, one at a time, would give communion, would come down and take communion led by the dad. And then we would circle the auditorium and sing songs and, and pray and, and go out and have our, our time with our family. Well, that's great, unless you have small children, right? So there was a Christmas, the boys were little, and I was like, it was our two older boys, we didn't have Elizabeth and Benjamin yet. And I was like, hey, you know, I'm just gonna stay home. I don't think the boys can, can take the whole thing, and, but you know, grandma wants to show off her grandsons, right? They have cute outfits, that's the rule, it's in the rule book, so we go to the service. It was fine. Well, Blake gets, has to go to the bathroom. Well, when you're not at your own church, you don't know where everything is, right? So all the years, I assumed the bathroom was in the lobby, but it's not. So I went out, and I went to the lobby, and there was, there was no bathroom in the lobby. I was like, well, where's the bathroom? So I thought, well, try the other building. I went out the door, went around, it was locked, went to go back in, the building was locked. It's 19 degrees on Christmas Eve. My coat, my car keys, everything is in church, and we're locked out. 
on the outside of the lobby. So we could have banged all night. Nobody would have heard us. And so I, I had a sweater on, thankfully, but I took it off and it kept Blake warm. And we survived. And our cars were all like, anyway, we got through that. A few years later, we went back. Elizabeth was a baby. And so again, maybe I should stay home with Elizabeth. You know, we, this didn't go real well the last time. Maybe we should just stay home. Again, Grandma, no, we got to take the baby. So we take the baby, and Elizabeth loved food. Like, she was a teeny tiny baby. She was like 18% in, in um, height or in weight, but head circumference was off the charts. So it was like this. But she ate like there was no tomorrow. So if you put food in front of this child, it was like, mmm. So when they picked up the plate with the, with the communion wafers, she started dive bombing and drooling. So I'm like, we're the second people to go. Like, all you people out there have drooled on crackers. And my mother in law is trying to pick out the shiny ones, right? Like, I'm trying to get the. So it looks like the pastor's wife is stealing all the communion crackers. I'm like, this is craziness. So I thought, okay, I've got to get a, I have a better plan. I've got to get a better plan for this. So when we were visiting this summer, I learned the layout of the church. So in order to go to the bathroom from the auditorium, you had to go out the side door to get into the uh, older part of the church. So one of these churches have been built on and built on and built on. So I thought, okay, we got a plan. And Benjamin had come along, so Elizabeth and Benjamin. So I thought, well, as soon as we do communion, I'll take Elizabeth and Benjamin to another room, and then we can just do whatever until it's done, right? Well, that particular Christmas Eve, my father-in-law had asked me to do a reading, and so that was great. We, I got it all ready. It was good to go, and came in and put on a, a, a headset mic. And he said, which I should have remembered, he said, my sound guy isn't here. He said, so I'll run up and turn the mic on, and then you're good to go. Okay. So, plan, set, got up. Uh, I did, uh, the pastor spoke, I did my reading, uh, we did communion, I took Elizabeth Benjamin, and we left. And we found a room that used to be an auditorium with, with a really high pitched ceiling. And that was just a play area, and there was a rocking chair and a ball. It was perfect. I didn't plan that, but it was perfect. It was in the right place. And so I sat in the rocking chair with Elizabeth, Benjamin was playing with the ball. And we're having a great time. And Elizabeth said, hey, Daddy, will you sing me Silent Night? So I'm like, okay. Like, I'd been singing her Silent Night as a lullaby that Christmas season. And so I started singing. Silent night, holy night. And I sounded good in that auditorium, right? <laughs> and I was feeling good about it. So I sang the whole song. I sang all the verses. What I didn't know was that my mic was on me and it was still on. Because when my father-in-law went to the balcony to turn the microphone on and he came to the auditorium down to run the service, he never, there was no one to turn it off. So there's this music coming through the speakers. Nobody knows what it is. <laughs> I don't know where it's coming from. And so Kimberly's mom was looking at her dad and they're trying to figure it out. And I don't know what's, what, what's, what's going on. And they thought someone down front was singing, but they left and the song was still happening. And then Elizabeth goes, hey, daddy. Can you sing O Holy Night? Well, sure. Like, I sounded really good. Like, we're in a great place. So here we go. O Holy Night, the stars are brightly shining. I may not be a good singer, but I'm a big singer, okay? <laughs> and so when I was feeling good, I wasn't holding back. So I get to the first verse, I go right to the second verse. Uh, what is it? Um, Oh, holy night, I forget now, but it's the whole part where chain shall he break for the slave is our brother and in his name all oppression. And I stopped. Why? Oops, I had to hold that up. <laughs> I'm so confused. My father and I came running to the door and as soon as he came to the door, I had a thousand thoughts and I knew what happened. Peace was shattered and I just start pulling the microphone out of my sweater. I just start pulling it out of my sweater and throwing it at him. I'm like, what's that going to do? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> well, after that night, the pastor decided that maybe we should take a break from the Christmas Eve service. <laughs> so I have retired a Christmas Eve service at a church in South Carolina. And, it's, and as funny as that story is, it was funny. I mean, I lived it, so it was funny. It was unfortunately funny at my expense. But in a moment, a peaceful moment as a dad was shattered. In a moment. Like, we were in, a, we were in the right place. The right, I had a plan. I had a purpose. I was being a good dad. I was taking care of my kids. We were sharing a moment, and peace was shattered. And some of you, many of you, can relate to that. That at some moment in your life, because of a phone call, because of a knock on your door, because of a letter, because of whatever, your peace is shattered. And when that happens, what do you do? 
Well, I want to challenge you today. Everybody raise your hand. When you think about peace, so boogie your pinky, peace. When you think about a place, then the people and purposes and your promises. Your pinky is your least important finger. Your ring finger is your most useless finger. If you do this, you can lift all of your fingers, but you can't lift your ring finger. That's why it's your ring finger, because it's useless. And your thumb is your most important. And your pointer gives you direction. So we're going to talk about peace and places and people and your purpose and the promises of God. And in this season of Advent, one of the traditions in my family growing up that we didn't incorporate with our children because we traveled all the time, we'd usually leave uh, middle of December to start seeing family because I was, a, I was a teacher, was Advent. And we didn't have just an Advent wreath. We had an Advent log. And so there were 25 candles. And so you would start on the left side and you'd light day one and then go to right day two and go back and forth. And each night we would pause, we would center around God's word. We would have people that we were praying for. We would choose families in need that we could help. And we'd remember who God is and what God's done for us and how we could continue that as a channel of blessing. And so Advent is about not missing Jesus. That's what we learned in the very beginning. It's just a tool that reminds us who Jesus is. Because when we did the Advent log, on Christmas Day, when we left the whole log, it had burned down to a point. And so everything pointed us back to Jesus. So the first Sunday that Pastor Joey, I have to remember how to do this, had a really hard time. There we go. We learned about the candle of hope. We learned a lot about it. <laughs> and we're going to meditate on everything that we learned about the candle of hope. I, I guess hope is, hope is in our heart. It is not tied to a symbol. Because hope is the expectation based on the promises and person of God. And the promises of person of God are much greater than my ability to light this candle. Amen? Amen. So we'll see. We got one. I'm just going to keep going while I'm on a streak. Here we go. Oh, two. Two for two. There's three. One last try. Nope. I lied. Two last tries. There we go. So hope is bigger. <laughs> in the second week, we learned about faith and love. The dirty faith and love that was born in the manger in a very unexpected place, in a very unexpected time. But God sent Jesus, his son, to us. And what's so beautiful about that is although he was the son of a king of the most high, God sent him to earth in the lowliest of lowly places, to the lowliest of low in the shepherds, which was, which was the next candle, so that no one would be denied access to his son. Had he come in a palace at that time, it would have been something only for the wealthy and affluent. And the, the, the poor people of the day would have said, oh, it's not for us. The Messiah is for them. But God said, no, I'm going to break through all societal barriers and take Jesus to you. Because my promise is bigger than anything man thinks or can construe. So the joy that the shepherds brought in the joy candle. And this week we're going to look at the angel candle or the candle of peace. And what's so interesting to me is angels aren't peaceful. We have this, we have this image of these heavenly beings that just walk around and, and say nice things. But, but if you're just sitting having breakfast and a, and a fiery being shows up and says, fear not. I always love the first thing they say is fear not. Too late, right? I'm screaming like a woman. No offense. I'm up on a chair. I'm running for the door. I'm probably paralyzed with fear. But God says, fear not. I bring you a message. And so we're going to look at Luke 2, classic, another one of the traditions of my family. And we would always read the Christmas story, as many of you do, on the Christmas morning. But as we read it, I want you to think about it. I want you to think about a concept. And, and, and don't judge these words. Terrifyingly diabolical peace. What does that mean? Some, and I, don't, I, I can't watch action adventure things or scary things because I get so emotionally involved, it terrifies me, and I, I respond viscerally. 
Um, and so it's just, uh, I can't do it. But you know, the scariest villain is not the crazy person. The scariest villain is the calm one, right? The one who's unexpected. The one who's like, you just blew up a whole city and you're not even sweating. You're not even responding. Like, have you no heart? Have you no soul? But think about the concept of our ability because of the power of the Holy Spirit to have peace in a storm, to have peace in a trial. And the world says, whoa, what? You messed up. Like, there must be something wrong with you. The disciples were so full of the Holy Spirit, people thought they were drunk. But it was just the power of God. And so when we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and have the peace of God, the world is terrified. And even in Paul's day, when they were going after him in the message of the gospel, the men of the day said, you know what? If it's a man, it's going to pass. But if it's of God, we have no power against it anyway. Even the world recognizes the power of God. And one thing that makes me mad, my insurance company says, if it's an act of God, they don't have to pay. Like, I can't talk about God in certain places, but you can pull the God card when it comes to insurance that I've paid for. That's a double standard. We'll do, we won't stand in there. Let's go to Luke 2. It's a better place to rest. So think about this story and think about putting yourself in this place. And it came to pass in those days that went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone to his own city. And Joseph, what a character, also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. So many prophecies fulfilled in that verse. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Now, there's a rule in my house dictated by my mother. If a woman is pregnant or getting married, do whatever she wants, no questions asked, because life is better for everyone involved. So when your lady is at the end of a pregnancy, there is no comfortable position. And people asking, so are you ready? What do you do? You just want to hit them, right? You just want to hurt them and get them out of your life. Or when they pat your stomach, like my wife would just start patting people's stomachs back. They're like, why are you doing that? She's like, why are you patting my stomach? (laughs) Back up. Anyway, so it was uh, that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid, rightly so. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, there it is, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people, for unto you, not anybody else, you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And here's this, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace. Really? <laughs> like, I'm shaking my boots, but there's going to be peace? From this peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they heard it, and all that they had heard, wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told them. When we think about this story, we often take it for granted. And if we're not careful, it could become plastic figurines that mark the season. But do you understand the God of the universe who wanted to be in relationship with us created a perfect environment, a perfect world, And Adam and Eve, mankind, we messed it up. But he loved us so much, he promised a savior. He promised to reinstate us into his family. He pursued us. And this birth was the fulfillment of countless prophecies. It's amazing if you study the birth of Christ and the number of prophecies it fulfilled. And so when we we talk about faith, it is so easy to believe when you think about the legitimacy of all the prophecies that were filled in the person of Christ and the bloodline, and the lineage. It's amazing. And I love the character of Mary. You see, Mary was at peace. She was in the right place. 
she was surrounded by the right people. When she heard about Jesus being born in her, she went to see her cousin. She surrounded herself with the right people. She had a purpose to fulfill what the angel had told her, and she claimed the promises of God. Joseph doubted, but God intervened in his life. Mary stayed true the entire time. Joseph submitted to the leading of the Holy Spirit. He was at peace, again, the right place, the right people. He stayed on purpose, claiming the promises of God. Here's a promise verse in our life, Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. And sometimes we like to extract promises. Like, I'm, I'm going I'm to have hope in God. But what does it say? May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing. It's our belief in God and his promises that allows him to fill us with his joy and peace. And not by us, by the power of the Holy Spirit. That you may abound in hope. At this season... There are so many people who feel hopeless. There are so many people who are hurting. And we don't, we, we can't forget that. Like sometimes in my joy, I would forget the needy. One year, one year for Christmas, my sister was getting ready, and my niece said, Mommy, what if Jesus came back right now? And she was in the middle of her do list. She goes, It would mess up everything. She's like, No, 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 no. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It would be the best Christmas ever. But you know, we get so caught up in doing good and ministering. We forget the God of the ministry. And so it's really, really important that in this season that we submit ourselves to the power of the Holy Spirit and that we let him fill us with joy and peace so that we can abound in hope and share the hope of the gospel. Advent isn't magical or special. It's just a remembrance. To remember that Jesus is the reason that we celebrate this season. So this peace that the angel spoke of, this peace that, uh, that, that the Bible talks about. Peace that passes understanding. What is it? A uh, definition of peace is the state of tranquility or quiet. See, when I was in that back room on that Christmas Eve service, I was in tranquility. It was quiet. I was singing. I was with my kids. It was great. There was chaos all around me that I didn't know about, and I was unaffected by because I was in the right place with the right people, just enjoying the promises of God. But in the Greek... The word is irene, and it takes it to this distinction, the opposite of division or dissension. So when we're at peace, we're in unity. And that's a big concept for us to think about because often we justify a peaceful act or a peaceful moment to define a circumstance when really we're hiding behind something. And it's a, it's a defense mechanism. I love the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace to you. It takes it to a whole different level. God's chosen people said hello and goodbye using the word shalom. So let's look at some differences between peace and shalom. Peace can be a smokescreen or a covering. Peace can be a smokescreen. Shalom is a covering. So when we say, I'm at peace, I'm at peace, and, and someone can hear the tension and see the tension in your body, you're not. Because when you're at peace, you're tranquil, you're relaxed, you're quiet. We would, when I worked with students in the arts, relaxation was critical. If there's tension in your body, you can't perform. And so one of the tests was you to put your arm out and just drop it. So we'd hold the arm. If there was any resistance, we knew they weren't relaxed yet. So they had to get to the place, complete relaxation, because complete relaxation is complete trust. I'm not worried about anything else. At one Christmas, we were visiting with our kids, and my son had been given a weighted blanket. We were in Indiana, and he brought it with him. I lay down in the chair, and I was just at the right body position where there were no stress points, so circulation internally was flowing, and they put this weighted blanket on me, and I crossed my arms around my chest, and I felt safe, secure, and I fell asleep, and the world could have blown away, and I'd have died happy uh, because I was covered in security. And so when we allow peace, God's peace, to cover us as a blanket, we can stand in faith and hope and love and peace that shows the world there's a void in their life that can only be filled by God. One can dictate peace, but shalom is a mutual agreement. So as you go on this holiday season, we all have that person in our life, in our family, who likes to have it their way. 
control. And what's really difficult, it's usually, well, if we just did this, everyone would be happier. No, you'd be happier because you're selfish and controlling. That's what we're all thinking, but we don't say that because we'll disturb the peace, right? And if that's what we're thinking, that's what's happening, we have a false sense of peace. But if we can mutually agree in that, there's a fulfillment of our desire. How do we do that? We're going to talk about some pointers in just a minute. So peace can also be a temporary pact. Shalom is a permanent agreement. I, I've had the privilege of spending some time ministering in Southeast Asia, and I took a uh, performing team. We were there for 21 days, and we had a great time. We were going to go back the next year, and God closed the door because at that time, Thailand was in a state of political unrest, and they were demonstrating, and they were blocking streets, and, <clears throat> and our advisors, and just said, it's, this is not the, the best time for y'all to go. It could be dangerous. What's interesting, in Thailand, there's a king, and the king has final say and complete and total rule. And at 6.30 in the morning, the national anthem is played. And if you're on the street, if you don't stop what you're doing until the anthem is finished, you're arrested. 6.30 in the same thing. Like wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you have to stop. So Thailand is built on tourism. And so this unrest was stopping tourism. So the king just went on national television and said, protest is over, take your things and go home. Guess what everybody did? Boom, like that. Had anything changed? No. Had any agreement been met? No. But there was a dictated peace that isn't true peace. And sometimes we try to dictate peace to cover a hurt or to cover a real issue. And we, we can't just assume peace if we haven't healed properly the hurt that's in our heart. So if we want a true fulfillment of that desire, we've got to come to a mutual agreement with the God of all creation. Peace can be a temporary pact. Shalom was a permanent agreement. Uh, we don't want to band-aid something. I, a couple weeks ago, I'll give you the short version. My wife calls the Reader's Digest version. I was being a good husband. I went to a place to pick up some Christmas trimmings for my wife. I tripped and fell and fell into a pallet wall, busted my head, busted my ear. I was bleeding. It was really, I felt really stupid when it happened, and a lady handed me a wipey to wipe my I was like, I can't. I don't have eyes back there. <laughs> like, what, what's, what's happening? She's like, well, you're bleeding. Well, I kind of figured that because it's dripping on my shoulder. So I did this. And now the wipe is covered in blood. And now she can't touch it because blood is very controversial, right? Uh, and there's, there's no, I, I don't know what to do, but I know I need more help than this. Like if I had just done the wipey and left, it would have been infected. It, would, it, it could have gotten bad. I went, to the, I went to the ER and got a tetanus shot because I wanted to make sure I was completely healed from that moment. I didn't want to just take a wipey and wipe off the, the, the blood and put a band which you couldn't put a Band-Aid. Ended up bandaging my whole head. Looked like I was a trauma victim. Uh, it was a great picture, great to lie. We'll, we'll spare you that. But one can make a peace treaty. Shalom is a condition of peace. A peace treaty is mutual distrust. Shalom is mutual trust. Mutual distrust says, I want you to sign this paper because that's going to make sure you agree to this. And if you don't, I have a course of action. Mutual trust says, I can live peaceably with you because we're on the same page. We're on the same team. We have the same purpose. And there's complete peace in that. Peace can be negative, the absence of commotion. I had four children, and at one point, we were studying drums, keyboard, piano, electric guitar, acoustic guitar, bass guitar. And they would, for some reason, all practice at the same time. And it would drive me insane, because they were all different levels of ability, playing different songs. And so I would stop, no, headphones, close your door. And so I would stop it, sit up in their own way, so I'd fix it, it was the absence of commotion, but I was all upset. So we had to rethink. We had to rethink the way we did things. And then peace can be partial. Shalom is whole. Sometimes we have a false sense of peace. Why that? Because we choose, well, well, this is good, right? I'm good at this, so we're not going to worry about all the rest of this stuff. I'm going to be peaceful here. Or peace can be piecemeal. Shalom is complete. Sometimes we're claiming peace in the midst of chaos. But complete peace, we stand firm in spite of chaos around us. So where are you today? Are you fighting for a false peace? Are you striving to be in shalom? This week was a crazy week for me. Um, we had families in church in crisis, which is pretty common. Uh, my family, my, not my immediate family, my extended family, there were two family crises there. We had an unexpected funeral um, this week. All kinds of things were happening. And, uh, and we had all these events. It's, it's a busy time of year. And so Wednesday afternoon, I was hitting a breaking point, <clears throat> And I walked in the office and I said, hey team, come around. 
this is where I am, this is what's happening, this is what we need to do, and I need to trust that you're going to do this. And they jumped right in. So I had to fight into peace. I had to be in the right place. I know that I'm where I'm supposed to be, serving God, serving at Wellspring Community Church. And I had to surround myself with the right people. Well, if I hadn't done that before Wednesday, I would have been in crisis, right? So think about who your friends are. Think about who you spend time with, who you rely on. And I was able to call them to task because we have a shared purpose and because we have relationship and because we believe in the promises of God, that God's going to get us through even when we don't feel like we're able to do that. So as we face Christmas, as we face this season, I'm going to give you five practical pointers for peace. How do you find peace in this crazy season and wonderful season, right? So first of all, know and claim the promises of God. Know and claim the promises of God. A couple things here. Uh, this is a big verse right now, and I, I love when verses are trendy, right? Or my students would say, well, that's just cliche. I was like, if you want to make the Bible cliche, that's between you and God. But God's promise is real yesterday, today, and forever. They're like, if you want to pull the cliche card, I'll pull the promise of God card. <clears throat> uh, Joshua 1.9 says, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And it's a great promise, right? But what about Joshua 1.8 that makes his promise come to life? This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate therein day and night. Observe to do according to all that's written therein, for then you will make your way prosperous. Then you'll have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage? So if we're not meditating on God's word, if we're not thinking about what God says, if we're not hiding it in our heart, if we're not living it out, when the trial comes, or when that phone call comes, or when that shattering moment comes, we're not going to be strong and courageous. Because we have no relationship to build it on. We, have, we haven't prepared ourselves. I, I, I competed for a long time. When I was in, in competition, everything in my life was about competition. Everything was about competition. So much so, I, I got really convicted. It's another whole sermon story. But I was so consumed. I knew how to be successful. I knew what it took. And someone asked me to perform. I was like, you know, I've done that a long time. Well, you could do it. No, actually not. Uh, re realistically, I'm about six months from being back at performance quality. It would take me that long to get to back in and be like, whoa, what is that? Because things don't happen easily or just naturally. But when we're in something, when, when I was performing all the time, I could walk in and teach a class with five minutes notice. Like, hey, someone said, can you, yeah, I, I got it. I've, I've literally walked into a theater and been put into a show. No lie. Walked in and said, hey, someone got hurt in a car. You're on in five minutes. And I was learning, learning lines in the wings because I was doing it all the time. I wasn't afraid, why? Because I was immersed in that world. And I got convicted, I'm giving all of this to theater, what am I giving to God? Yeah. I'm giving my best to something else. So what are you giving your best to? Because when trials come, that's what you're gonna fall back on. And if your best isn't to God, you're gonna feel alone. God's with you every step of the way. It's us, we don't, he never lets us move away, but we put so many things in our heart and mind that we feel like we're away, right? And he feels distant. That's on us, not on him. So we've got to renew our mind with the scripture. Are you in the scripture? Are you learning the promises of God so that you can claim them? Because if you don't know them, you can't claim them. You know, we are, we are rule followers in our house. When we play games, like we play to the death. And if someone tries to cheat, oh, no, 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 no. We have God online and checked rules. We've called companies for clarification. Like you can't do that. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. And so, but if we don't know the rules, we can't execute it properly, right? So if we don't know God's promises, how can we claim them? So maybe we need to spend some time just getting in God's word to remember his promises, to remember who he is. Second thing, have clear expectations. The Apostle Paul says, just listen to Philippians 1.20, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or death. Paul is a great one in the Bible. He always knew his place in Christ. He always knew his purpose, and he rarely ever wavered. He was at peace in every storm. It's amazing. You want to study peace? Study Paul. It is peace and chaos at every turn. But Luke tells us in six, uh, Luke 6.35, but love your enemies, do good, and give, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. 
Boy, it's easy to give to nice people, isn't it? That's really easy. It's not easy to give to not so nice people. It's not easy to give to that relative that irritates the fire out of us. But God tells us to love the unlovely. Paul says, live with no regrets. It was a big thing for my dad. If you're embarrassed about something you do, you probably shouldn't be doing it. I was like, ah, that's, you're probably right, right? So what's your end game? Like this week, I was, I had the privilege not just to deal with crisis, but to meet with people who are doing great. I met with a man um, for lunch this week, and he is in a great place. He is seeking healing, and he's going through a great process. And he said this to me, he said, you know, I know I need more godly Christian men in my life so that when I get to a crisis moment, I've got people who are walking shoulder to shoulder with me who will get me on track. That's what community groups are all about, right? That's why we have them. They're not just social clubs. They're places you go when you're hurting, when you're broken. We had a man in our community group. He was having a really difficult time um, right, driving home in traffic. It was setting him over the edge. It was frustrating. He was coming home. He was being negative. He said, guys, I just, need, I just need your love and support. We set our alarms for 4.30 every day. Started texting. Hey, we're praying you home. We're praying you home. We're praying you home. Just knowing that people were there praying and, and, and battling heaven for you, for him, gave him the encouragement he needed to make choices in spite of circumstance. You know, at Christmas, when we traveled, uh, and, I, and I make no, no apologies for this, as a grandpa, there are no no's in my vocabulary. If my granddaughter even at, she's not even quite two yet, whatever she wants, she gets. I don't care. Like, tell me no. You can't tell me no. I, I'm, I'm still your dad. You have to honor and obey and trust and all those biblical things. So just go. Um, Sage and I are fine. But as a parent, it was frustrating, right? <laughs> so we would leave our house, and we would go to my mom's, uh, my mom and dad's, and they would be spoiled. We'd go to Kimmy's mom and dad's, and be spoiled. We'd go to a friend's house along the way, and they'd be spoiled. So we just thought, you know what? And our kids were getting in conflict because people were allowing them to do things that we didn't allow them to do. And it was like, okay. So we just sat down and had a family meeting. Said, hey, hey, this is how it's going to be. When you go to grandma's house, or we go to granny's house, they're in charge. It's okay. Their rules, whatever they say, it goes, and that's fine. But when you come home, remember who's in charge, and we're going to go to boot camp. And so when you come home in January, it's boot camp time. And so all privileges are off the table until you show me and remind me that you know how to obey, you know how to respond, you know how to interact appropriately, and that you, the world does not center around you. And the first year we did that, it took about three weeks. And as the kids got older, like two days. Like the faster they complied, the better off everybody was, right? So we had a clear expectation. They knew what was happening. Like when we would visit a family, when we were at Kimberly's house, I took kid duty. We were at my house. She took kid duty, so we would have freedom to interact with our families. When we went to activities, we would decide ahead of time, this is a kid activity, this is an adult activity, so our expectations were clear. We always let our kids know, at this activity, this is what you can and can't do. Don't abuse that. And if you don't, there'll be a reward. If you do, there'll be a consequence. So there were clear expectations. Often we jump into situations, we don't think about them, and then we get all upset, and we could have avoided that if we'd just taken time to think it through. Anticipate obstacles, number three. 1 Peter 5a, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Satan doesn't want you to win. Satan doesn't want you to be successful. Satan doesn't want you to be at peace. He wants to send darts. I said this before. It's the, those little things that will send you off. There's someone in our life who can say one word that destroys us. Like, we can take on the world. We can take on our company. We can take on our ministry. And that one person goes, ah. And you're like, Ugh. it ruins your day. It ruins your week. It can ruin your month. So don't let that happen. Don't let that happen. We had a friend. So we have good friends. We were anticipating a vacation, uh, a family obligation, and we're just like, we, we've got to be careful what we say, what we, what we hear. And oh, we had a friend who said, you know, uh, water falls off a duck's back, right? Because they prepare their leaves and waterproof them. And so you've got to let those words just fall off your back like water off a duck's back. And so she said, just quack. And so for about three years, when, when something was super, we just, my wife and I would quack at each other, quack. Like, what's that? Oh, it's an inside joke. <laughs> it means you're an idiot, but we're going to be okay in spite of you. Um, <laughs> all the things you want to say, but don't say, right? So uh, my family is very blunt. There are no filters in the Granger family. You don't have to worry about where you stand, but it can be offensive. So I'd driven all night, literally all night, to get to a family event. I walk in. My brother goes, what's wrong with you? Like, what do you mean? He goes, you look puffy. Like, what? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm tired. He goes, no, not just your face. Like, everything looks puffy. And, what do you mean? Like, and he wouldn't stop. And I said, well, what about you? You're like probably 50 pounds overweight. He goes, I've always been fat. You haven't. So what's up with you? I'm like, please, just go get something to eat, right? 
also, too, my brothers worked together on the farm for a long time. When I'd come home, they had a shared relationship that I didn't have. And so if I wasn't careful, I could be resentful of that. And there was not because there was any problem, but because they had commonality that I wasn't part of, and they weren't thinking anything negative to me. I was allowing a negative thought to become bigger than it needs to be. So I had to remind myself, like, they work together every day. They're going to have experiences I don't have. And I had to go back to, we had an agreement with my family, too, that when you came home, the farm and sports took precedent. Okay? If the Gators were playing, they weren't going to be home. If there's something happened in the farm, they weren't going to be home. I spent a lot of vacations and Christmases um, with my sister-in-laws and then all the nieces and nephews and cousins because I wasn't at the farm. They were at the farm. Something happened and they had to be there. Animals and plants don't wait for people. Uh, they, don't, they don't stop because of parties. And if the Gators were playing, the whole world stopped. <clears throat> That's another thing with my... Anyway, moving on. So I had to, we had agreements of expectations. And I had to remember to submit myself to those agreements. You have to decide ahead of time how you're going to respond. Don't expect negativity because if you expect it, you'll find it. Because here's what. They always say this. And as soon as they say something, you're going to see it negatively. You're going to hear it negatively. And it's going to put you in the wrong state of mind. You know what you should say? That person, that individual, is an image bearer of the Son of God. And God made them in his image and his likeness, and he loves them as much as he loves me. He died for them as much as he died for me, and he wants what's best for them, just what he wants for me. He's conforming them into his image and his likeness, and he's conforming me into his image and his likeness. And so we're on this journey together. And I don't want to be an obstacle to keep them from growing in their faith. So get out of the way. Just love. I, I, I was at lunch with a man this week, and he's dealing with a difficult family situation, and he said to me, he said, my goal is to not mar the relationship I want to make sure that when we get through this trial, that there's still a relationship. That's a great goal because it's biblical. Because the Bible says they'll know we are Christians by our love. Love is the greatest of all gifts that God's given us. And if we can love people in spite of themselves, guess what? We're loving like Jesus. Because Jesus continually went to the lowly of the low. The people that Jesus ministered to were an embarrassment to the Pharisees. They were an embarrassment to the, to the, to the, to the, to the religious leaders of the day. But Jesus wanted us to know that no matter where we are, no matter what state of mind, no matter what state of condition we have found ourselves, that his love is greater and will pursue us to bring us back to the fold because he's the shepherd of the lost sheep. Determined to stand on the authority of God's word. Hebrews 4.11, 4.12, excuse me. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is the discerner of thought and intent of the heart. And often... We think of this verse for everyone around us. I'm going to go browbeat my family into heaven. I'm going to tell them what they're doing wrong. I'm going to tell them how to get right. My younger brother decided that I was fat, and he got, me, got us a gym membership. I was working at the farm 12, 14-hour days. They were driving the brand in to go work out. I ended up with tendonitis in both arms from my fingertips, my shoulder blades. For two weeks, I couldn't lift a newspaper uh, because my muscles were so overworked. So we're not trying to fix everyone. We're actually trying to submit to the Holy Spirit so the Holy Spirit can use us to be a channel of blessing. Jesus was a servant leader. Jesus served those closest to him. Jesus served those who needed um, his help the most. And so when we come in, going back to Romans, by the power of the Holy Spirit, full of joy and peace, he said, I want to be a blessing. I just want to bless you. I want to help you. I want to serve you. I want to, I want to accommodate. I want to be there for you in time of need. It changes the atmosphere. It changes the tide. You know, peace is a choice. And peace is a lifestyle. The places we are, we can't always dictate. Sometimes we find ourselves in unlikely places. But the people that we surround ourselves, we have control over. I was having a crisis a few weeks back, and I have a mentor that's not here. And I called him, and he said, love and forgive. Love and forgive. I knew I needed to call him. And every time I, every time I tried to justify my action, he said, love and forgive. Love and forgive. I was like, I got it. I got it. And I knew, here's the thing. I knew it before I called him. I knew what I was supposed to do. I love this statement. I just don't know what's wrong. I just don't know what I'm supposed to do. That's a lie. That's that smoke screen. I just don't know. Yes, you do. You just don't want to man up or woman up and step into to your calling as a son or daughter of Jesus Christ and say, I was wrong. Forgive me. I want to build a bridge. I want to show Christ like love. So we stand on the authority of God's word. Let's put that lens on our heart and pray like David. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. And 
then you can be used as a vessel by the power of the Holy Spirit. And finally, the fifth one is walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy, two seven, second Timothy 1, 7. I messed that up in the, in the original notes. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Fear is not of God. It's just not. If you're afraid of something, you're telling God he's not enough. When you're not peace, it's not of God. What I, what I, 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 I mentored a lot of people over the years. And one, of the, one of the first things I say is, are you at peace? I'm going to pray that you find peace with God because that's biblical and that's transcendent. Because if we get into the nitty-gritty of what they're going through, often they want to justify. It's a partial peace, or it's a fix, or it's a justification. But are you truly at peace with God? Because if you're not, guess what? We've got we to gotta go to God. We've got to make it right in our heart. And we've got to stand in faith and power. We've got to quit cowering from the enemy. Because if the enemy can make us cower, it makes us ineffective. Because we're not going out and being bold. Um, share a simple illustration. <clears throat> We live on a street uh, off 19th, and uh, Maggie Rodriguez is down the street, and Charnay is on the street, and Lindsay, Lindsay Williams is on the street, and down this way is John and Taylor. They all come to church. They've all been invited by myself or, or Maggie, and then right down this way, a couple moved in, and my wife was just knocking doors, meeting people in the neighborhood, and she met them and uh, came back, invited them to church. They came to church and visited. Someone else in church saw them and greeted them, invited them to their house and to, to an event, just sharing the love of Christ. Making someone feel welcome, making someone feel seen and loved. That's what God calls us to do. Let the Holy Spirit do the rest of it. We just got to be a vessel. I was, at, I was at Aldi, and I met Janet. She was wearing a, a, a Jesus shirt, and I was wearing a, a kid's shirt. She's like, oh, you listen to Joy FM? I was like, well, yeah, but this is my, from my church. She goes, what church? I said, Wellspring Community. She goes, can I go there? And usually I'm over there, so I don't get to see a lot of you all. So um, we're like, we got to meet, and she was just full of the joy of the Holy Spirit right there at Aldi. And it was a blessing to the lady who was checking out. She goes, that's a, that's a really nice lady. I said, yeah, she loves Jesus. I just met her, so I, I can't wait to get to know her. You know, we come together. Why do we come together? So we can be strong in the body of Christ. You know, when I fell, I broke a toe, I bruised my bad knee, I bloodied the side of my face, and you realize how much everything works together right? They gave me a tetanus shot in this arm, so I was like, I've got a good right leg. That's the only thing that isn't hurting right now, right here. But I'm going to stand strong on this leg, okay? But when we're in a body of believers, when there's hurt, someone come beside you and say, I'm going to hold up your arm. Someone that says, I'm going to hold up your arm. I'm going to support you from behind. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray over you. And that's where we find the peace of God. Because we're not trying to fix people or circumstances. We're just trying to love God and be a light and be a vessel and be a channel. So as you go out this Christmas season, Advent reminds us to not miss Jesus. It reminds us of the hope of our salvation. It reminds us of the faith and love that it took for people through the centuries to get us to Jesus' birth, to get us to his resurrection, to get us to the moment that we live in today. And the world needs a Savior. And this world, more than anything right now, needs the peace of God. There is so much uncertainty. There is so much fear. The world, don't be discouraged, be encouraged. Stand in the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't compromise, don't waver. Love as Christ loved and share the gift of peace this holiday season. Let's pray. God, we come before you today. We just thank you that we can. We thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son to be born in a manger. And God, help us not relegate Christmas to some little figurines. But Lord, help those figurines point us back to you. Help Advent point us back to you so that we can share the good news of the gospel. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, those of you joining us online, on camera, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for taking time out of your life to spend time with us, but most importantly, spend time with God and with Jesus. And some of you today say, hey, I, I want to have that peace, but I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know the author of that peace. And that relationship is so important because if we're not a son or daughter of God, we don't know how to experience the peace that God gives us when we become part of his family. So in just a moment, if you say, Pastor Johnny, whether you're online or in here, I want to know the author of that peace. We're going to pray a prayer together. And the prayer is not magical. It's just something that we say 
to share our heart with God, to acknowledge that we need Him, to acknowledge that we want Him to be Lord and Savior of our life. We're going to pray that together with you. If you're here in the audience, if you're here online, pray this prayer with me if you want to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life and have peace this season. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for sending, coming to be born and to die for me. I need you, Lord, in my life. Forgive me of the wrong and the sin that I've done. Wash my heart clean. Be my Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer on the count of three, would you raise your hand? We just want to put a card in your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand. I see those hands right there. Anybody else? You prayed that prayer. We just want to send a card, put a card in your hand, invite you to stop at our VIP tent, tell us about your decision. If you prayed that prayer online, there's a, there's a button that you can um, put, um, tap right in the, the chat box um, to connect you with a pastor. So for those of you who are part of God's family, here's my challenge to you. Determine to be an agent of peace this season with your family, at your workplace, in your community, when you're out shopping and, and people are crazy, be an agent of peace. Be a reflection of the God of the universe and show his love like only he can through you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.